for magicians because his tricks are all original, he creates them himself, and they are all so fantastic that he fools <coughs> magicians. And that's where he's got his claim to fame. The great Blackstone, who you may have heard of, is one of the world's greatest magicians, has commented that Jerry does the best close-up magic that he has ever seen, ever. So please welcome Jerry Andrus, one of the finest magicians in the world. Uh, I wonder if you gentlemen could get out there someplace so you won't get a free lesson. <laughs> You want to stay back here? Yeah. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. You need Take me just a moment to set up here. thing up here that thinks thoughts for us and it can even think a thought before we think it to that is subconsciously and part of this subconsciousness uh, we have no control over and uh, so if I look out at a uh, if I looked out at a square table uh, if I was looking straight down on it, it look square if I was looking at an angle like this it would look like a diamond on my retina. If we could photograph the image on my retina, it would be a diamond shape. Now, if, if each time I looked at a table in that configuration, I had to consciously make a decision of what shape that actually is, I couldn't function in society. So this computer, or whatever we have in our head, automatically, when I look out at that table there, it automatically jumps to the conclusion that that is a round table on my retina, there's an ellipse. So that's a round table, and if I look straight down, it will be, be round. And so I've learned, like you have through life, if I went over and looked straight down the table, surely enough it would be round. And so we can't help ourselves. We have to jump to these conclusions. And so we see things, and our mind translates it for us before we are aware of what it is. It's almost like something happening, uh, say there's a big building here and you're on a sidewalk here, and there's a, here's the corner, and around here there's something happening and you can't see it directly. But somebody here on the corner is standing there describing to you what's happening there. This is the way, in a sense, that our vision is, is that I look out and what I would say to myself is, I see you. But what really happens is uh, the light rays are bounced off of you or whatever I'm looking at, and my subconscious mind says that its best guess, guess is that there's a human being sitting there that, that looks like this and this and this. And if I go over there, sure enough it is. So I can't help myself, and neither can you. We have to jump to these conclusions. If, if we had a, uh, if we look at this square at an angle, it looks like a, a diamond shape, and if we had another thing, which is actually a diamond shape, if I could hold them in exactly the right configuration, they would both look basically the same to you. Yet you might say they're entirely different. Uh, another example is, is a circle uh, on a, at an angle, it's an ellipse, and here's uh, an actual ellipse, which is much bigger than a circle. If I get this uh, at the right angle, uh, it would look like a circle, assuming that you have no other clues to it. You see, yet actually it's a large ellipse. You could even have a, a small ellipse like this. Obviously, they're grossly different in size. And if you put this like this, and I'm not sure I have it at the right angle there. You see, they both viewed from the proper angle with uh, the proper light, they both look the same, yet they're entirely different. This is just uh, one example of, of uh, why we can be fooled. Now, I've been fooled many times. Uh, I've been fooled, you might say, by myself. And I've been fooled a lot of times by other magicians. Uh, one example of it, not too long ago, well, in fact, it was almost a year ago, um, I had been shopping, I came back into the castle of chaos that's where I live in Albany it's my home and if you ever come and visit me you'll understand why that's the name of it the castle of chaos anyway I was in there and I heard an uh, I'd been out shopping I came back I was in the kitchen I heard a noise it was kind of a rushing noise 
And I looked around and I, I didn't find it. And I thought, well, maybe it's something outside. I went out and opened the door, it wasn't outside, and I came back in, I could still hear it. Now, I was born with an insatiable curiosity and it's been getting greater ever since. And I'm 60 now. And by this time now, I'm afraid that this sound is going to go away and I will never find out what it was. And so I started searching around for it, and near the room where I have this, uh, I have a fabulous electronic organ that I built that uses electric eyes, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, there was a box of, of miscellaneous parts, electronic parts and stuff, laying down near the door. And I leaned over and I heard this rushing noise faster, and so my mind told me it is in the box. I thought maybe it was an aerosol can that had gotten the, I don't keep the lids on them, and many times they've gotten the lid pushed and sprayed paint in a box. And then what I found out it actually was, I carry a tape recorder with me all the time now, so when I think of an idea, I put it down because I have such a poor memory. Normally at home I have it fastened here and in my shirt pocket. Well, I had, each Halloween I do something different. And I had, I had, I was practicing the monologue that was going to be on the tape for Halloween. And I was going to Fred Meyer's shop and I turned it on in my pocket and I was listening to it to see what it sounded like. And it came to the end of my conversation on the tape. And the tape was still running, but I couldn't hear it in the car. I forgot that it was on. I shopped. There was noise all around. I finally got home where it's quiet. Then at first I started hearing this rushing noise. And when I leaned over to the box, the, the speaker part of the tape recorder is here, near my chest, you see. And when I leaned over, my shirt pocket opened it up, and it came out louder. That's just one example of, of, where, of where I was fooled. Another funny thing, I was a lineman for most of my life, ran a, a working farm on a line crew, uh, and uh, we trimmed the trees around the power lines. We had one man would be up in the bucket and the other two men on the ground. And uh, there was a fellow who used to work with me named Fred O'Neill, and he had found a little, little lizard, little one of these icky little lizard things or spider things or something. And he, he said, here, Jerry, and he hold out your hand. And I held it out and he dropped it on him. Well, it just didn't happen to startle me. So he put it back in his pocket and he said, I'll try it on Ken. And it just happened, the way my luck goes, uh, it just happened while I was working up in that bucket and I looked down and Fred O'Neill had forgotten about this in his pocket and he felt something in his pocket and he'd forgotten all what it was and I just had to be looking. He reached in and pulled this thing out and scared himself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have a terribly poor memory and I normally I carry my watch like this and if I have something important to remember I put it over on my right wrist and if I have something very important to remember I put it over on my right wrist on the inside if I have something extremely important to remember I put it like this now there's many times in my life I've looked over and found my watch like this and I know one thing for sure that I have something very very important to remember a lot of times I can't <laughs> <laughs> One time when I was back east, uh, I was coming into Hartford on a train, and uh, this uh, I was supposed to call this head shrinker. I knew him socially. He was a magician, and we were going to get together. And he said, Jerry, when you get into the station, call me, and I'll come and pick you up. So I uh, got into the station, and I went to the, there was a row of phone booths, and I went to the one on the right and uh, dialed uh, his office. And the nurse said that he was with a patient and he'd call me back. So I gave her the number of the booth and I went and sat down and waited. And I'm the type of person who, uh, if I'm waiting for a phone call, uh, you know, I, I'm afraid I'll miss it and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, it didn't come, it didn't come. And finally I thought, well, I'll go call Air Express and see if this package is in. So I didn't want to tie up that booth. I went into the one next to me, uh, next to the other one, and I looked up Air Freight. And this, what I'm describing now, is what we call a magic effect. It's not actually what happened, but it's what, what our mind tells us happened. Anyway, I dialed air freight, and before the guy had time to pick up the phone, my phone started ringing in the next booth. And uh, it was illogical to, but since the guy hadn't picked up the phone, I just hung up and rushed around and picked up the phone, and I got nothing but a dial tone. So I went back in and I dialed air freight again. Now this time my mind told me the guy had actually picked up the phone. Well, this phone started ringing in the booth next to me and I did a very irrational thing because I always apologize to people if I 
to just turn it off. There's a little down switch down at the bottom on the amplifier. Uh, oh, there we go. Anyway, um, I did an irrational thing because normally if I get a wrong number, it's my fault. I always apologize to the person. Now, here's a guy who has twice come to the phone, and this time he's actually picked it up, and I hung up on him because I was afraid I'd miss my call. But when I got in there and picked up the phone and got a dial tone, it finally dawned on me that on the file cards I'd written these numbers on, I got them mixed up, and I was dialing the phone booth next to me, and when it started ringing, I was running in there and trying to answer it. <laughs> I was practically born and raised in Albany, so I, when it came to magic, I ended up coming up with my own ideas. Everything I do in magic, I've invented myself. And I want to show you the perfect illusion. It's this yellow spot here on the card. Now, it's, it's not literally perfect, but I call it the perfect illusion. I call it the illusion of the yellow ball. Now, you will remember that first it was flat like that, flat like that. And then, look, it was the illu illusion of the yellow ball. Watch the illusion of the yellow ball. Now, look, this is what happens. You see, I form this into a cone around my left index finger like this, and it obviously is empty. Now, the only thing I have to be careful about, if that hole gets too large, you see the ball can get out. <laughs> now, I'm going to roll this into a tube instead of a cone, and you can see that the ball is still in there. Now, if I put one hand over each end of the tube, we all know that it is actually totally, literally impossible for that ball to get out, unless it is flat, like that, flat, like that. See, here's what actually happens. You form this into a cone, <laughs> like this and you have the illusion of the yellow ball. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, at least every other step, not every step. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, you, I just, if I want to try it, I just clench my fist when I, normally your, your arms would be up like this when you're running, unless you're running for show or the chest thrown back and however they do it. Uh, anyway, if you, if there's anyone here who runs, you try this. Uh, clench your fist and swing your arms down like this and it throws the blood into, you, into your fist, you see. Well, when that blood being thrown by centrifugal force gets there at the same instant that you, the, 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 the pulse from your heart gets there, you can feel it. And you can, uh, sometimes you'll get a weak pulse and then the next stroke you get a strong one and then a weak one, you see, and you're, you're just a little bit out of synchronization. Uh, also, I didn't want to waste my time while I was running, so I, I wanted to learn to play boogie-woogie on the organ and a friend of mine uh, George, does anybody know George Mom, who used to be from Eugene here, a terrific pianist? Anyway, he, he played some boogie-woogie rhythm slow for me on the piano, and I recorded it. And I tried to learn it on the organ, and I couldn't even do the rhythm with this hand after I got to do it and punch one note like this. See, I couldn't do it. It took all of my concentration to do this. So I decided while I was running, I'd learn to play boogie in my head, and so I was going like this in my head. And then I thought, why not train my hands independently? And I started running different, uh, like for instance, this hand, I'll run one, two, three from bottom to top, and the left hand I'm running one, two, three, four, back and forth. And I'm doing it while I'm talking to you. Now, when I first tried that, it took me a long time to even go through one, one sequence with it. But once you get adapted to it, uh, it, it becomes easy, and it becomes easier to do other things with your two hands independently if, if they uh, practice like that. Uh, does someone have a white handkerchief I can borrow? <coughs> I used to do a trick. Does anyone have a little larger one? Someone doesn't have a larger one. Paper one? What a paper one? No, this is just uh, this will work. I used to do a trick with a needle and thread and a borrowed handkerchief, and I carried the needle and thread around my pocket. And either I kept losing the needle or the thread got all tangled up. I finally made one I couldn't lose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the needle. Uh -huh. Obviously, with the aid of a pair of scissors, it would be easy, right? I'm going to do it the more difficult way, with the aid of a needle. And I've had people who are willing to testify that they actually saw that penetrate right into the fact. Isn't that an incredible illusion? Wouldn't you just swear, wouldn't you just swear that's going on to you? It did. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is one of my finest effects. Of course, I'm the first one to admit there is a tiny defect, just a tiny defect. In the does leave a rather jagged hole there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, incredibly enough, look, there is no hole at all.
one of the, the last book I wrote, uh, I wanted a design for the cover, and uh, I, I invented a heliocardiogram. Or, yeah, heliocardiograph, I guess you would call it. Uh, I wanted to make a moiré pattern for my heartbeat, and I didn't have electrocardiogram, so I stuck a little tiny square mirror, about a quarter inch square here, where I can see my pulse, and I first tested it outside. I got back about 100 feet from the sh white shop wall and the sun shining on the mirror, and I would move my arm like this, and I was getting a sweep there three feet high on the, the uh, side of the garage. Uh, I don't know whether any of the neighbors were watching, but <laughs> most of them, if they'd been there very long, they would, you know, they'd look out and they'd just say, well, it's some, you know, some crazy thing. Anyway, I, uh, I ended up, uh, I tried to put that on photographic paper. I had a drum turning in the dark room, and it didn't make a good line. So what I did finally was, uh, in the dark room, I had a little spotlight shining on a mirror and an and a, uh, electric eye here, and the spot would jump on and off the electric eye, and there was a drum turning with white paper on it, and when the, this electric eye was fed into an amplifier, it moved the needle back and forth this way. And it would, it would, I made, made a line about that long with four or five heartbeats in it. And it wasn't like, uh, it, it isn't accurate like a electrocardiogram, but anyway, it made an interesting design, uh, which I put on the front of the book. It, uh, it just shows two or three heartbeats, and then I, I made a circular printer that prints these designs. You can start with one line and, and print it uh, all the way around. My books are only sold to magicians. In fact, I uh, and it's this particular volume is for people who are avidly interested in it. it. Has a thousand and some illustrations in the back. And I've just been to two magicians' conventions in California, and I probably talked ten people out of buying the book. And I could have used thirty dollars to for each set, but I didn't think it was for them. So that they're not in libraries or anything else like that. And one other thing here that I might show you. It's loosely called a hypno disc, but it won't hypnotize you. But I will spin it, and I want you to look right at the center of it for about 20 seconds. Just keep looking right straight at the center of it, and it will look weird. And then when I say to, I want you to look over to those clouds in that picture, look at the clouds, look back and forth across the clouds, and you'll see something that you've probably never seen in your life. <laughs> there isn't really enough light in here, but I think it's probably good. Just a second. Just keep looking right at the center. Okay, now look at the clouds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I forgot to mention when I started talking, and I don't have any, I don't pretend any scientific knowledge about visual perception or any of the other. My knowledge is experimental. And uh, apparently, by what I believe happened is that uh, we are human beings are very adaptive, that's why we can survive, and if you go from a warm room into a cold one, you soon try to, your body tries to adapt to it. If you go out, out into the bright light, your eyes stop down and they try to adopt to this, uh, uh, or adapt to this bright light. And the old experiment you've heard of, if you have, uh, if you have a hot water and cold water and lukewarm water, and you put one hand in the hottest water, you can stand it, one in cold water, and let them get adapted to that as much as they will. And then you take them out, and you put this one that's been in the hot water in the warm water, and the warm water feels cool, and you put the one that's in the cold water in there, and the warm water feels hot. And so anyway, when this is spinning, you're, if you're looking right at the center, that part of your eye eventually tries to adapt to this, that it keeps seeing all the time, until it's treating it as normal, just like adapting to a dark room. And then, when you look at something else, it no longer fits this pattern of normalcy, and you get you get the opposite effect. 
you can look at the back of your hand or anything after you've looked at it a while. It, uh, Now, one other thing I want to mention before I finish that has to do with magic in a sense, and that's this, that when we were children and had it, we didn't understand or appreciate the wonder of life. When we grew up to where our brain was developed far enough that it would be possible for it to appreciate it, we had totally lost it almost because we have been sated with living and all these other experiences. And you take a, 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 a little child and you can frequently see the wonder of life in their eyes. A little toddler that's just up and around as they look at things. We've seen so many things that we just tend to, to totally accept this. And here each one of us has up here what could see, conceivably could be the most unique thing in the universe, you see, each one of us. And what we try to do, I guess what we do with it mostly is to have use it to carry our body around feed our face and so forth and so on. And uh, I think we'd all be better off if we, if we could stop and try to realize that, that this brain that we have is an incredibly wonderful thing and that life is an incredibly wonderful thing. I've thought a jillion times how tremendous it is that, that, that I can be talking with you and you can think a thought in your head and you move your vocal cords and you expel this air by them and it vibrates the air between us and it wiggles my eardrums and in my head I know what you have just said. I think it's a wonderful, incredible thing just like uh, uh, languages or libraries or anything. Now, uh, does anyone have any questions about anything I've said? If not, that concludes my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention.